part of the cloud. Another thing to say that this call will always have live transcription, which you can find on the top right. And I'm gonna click uh, and find the link for you to share. This is the Otter AI. So please do not activate Zoom transcription. They are not good. Otter AI is 95% all right. So there are some places where it still struggles with non-native English speaking like me. So uh, I hope you, you still are able to identify. Um, so again, those who just joined, welcome. This is our very first call with you all, uh, formally speaking. Today, we will be focusing on collaboration, particularly from the project design that you would be using in your own work. Before we get started, I would like for you to please um, let us know what your preference for today is. You can do that by adding one of these letters in front of your name on Zoom. Uh, if you don't know how to edit your name, you can add that in the chat and Shion would be able to edit your name or I can also help you edit your name. So you can interact today in written format. If you're in a place you can't speak or you, you just prefer written interaction, you can choose W. If you are interacting in spoken English, please select S-E-N. If you want to interact in spoken French in breakout room, you can use S-F-R. If you don't have many preference, you could also use others, but if you could avoid this, that would be great. The reason why, you, why we ask you to provide this preference is because when we create breakout room, we can make sure that the people with same preference are in the same room. I know that there are a few people here today who also prefer interacting in Spanish. We would have in the future call some more people joining from Latin American uh, teams. Then we would have more people with Spanish. So you can try. If we have enough people, we'll also put you in the room. Okay, this we will get used to and we won't spend as much time going forward, but it just takes one or two calls before people start to do it by themselves. We have a code of conduct that applies to this call. Um, so please uh, make sure that if anything, you would like to report any uh, unacceptable behavior, either you witnessed or experienced, please reach out to me, Bernice Yeo or Taj by emailing team at vrols.org. Um, you can also reach out to the individuals if you have to report something about me particularly or Taj who are involved in OLS9 delivery. As I see, some of you have already started to put your name. So we have, we're asking you today to tell us how you're feeling about your plans as part of EDIA Champions Program. I, my word is big start. I feel like this week is going to be very big. You all will be spending a lot of time. I hope you don't get overwhelmed because we've planned our calls to be more relaxing and holding a space where we can have shared conversation and get you started on your own project. Okay, and with that, I will actually start with a very quick presentation on open leadership, because that's what we've been saying over and over. That's the purpose of this program. So on our website, you would see that there's the 16 week program. Uh, today, we are gonna cover content from our uh, week, from the week two. And uh, just so for clarification, although you are in the current week, we have a, an OLS 9, which has already started a few weeks ago, and we're trying to catch up with them um, so that we can have most of our call with them around open science and community building. So today's focus is very much welcoming you to open seats again and to link for project design. In the onboarding call, we talked about that the origin of OLS and open seats is in Mozilla's open leadership. And therefore we apply the open leadership framework, which is a set of principle and practices skills that people anywhere in their work can use to mobilize their community to solve shared problem and achieve shared goal. There's a huge emphasis on shared problem, shared problem solving. Open leadership is defined as thinking and acting in service to others and accomplishing shared goals together. It's not about us defining the problem or us solving the problem alone but it is really about mobilizing the community that we are trying to serve. So the three principles that uh, are applied here are understanding. No matter what we build, we should think about, can other people understand it? Sharing, 
not just can I share it, but can someone else share my work with others? And finally, participation and inclusion. It's about making sure that the processes that we build in our project ensures participation of people who we want to work with. On the right, you're looking at a very typical open source project. So open source are open source software, which is where a lot of open collaboration within research have developed. You can think about a very traditional siloed research work where a person might be working on their own and they would defining what everything means from starting from problem to solution. Whereas in open source, open science, we think about collaboration where the problem is discussed and problem is, is defined closely together with other people who are in the same space and experiencing the same problem and identifying the solution that actually is building on the strengths of the community. When we think about open leadership in research particularly, there are a few things that you need to take into account. We are increasingly moving towards interdisciplinarity, learning from other disciplines, working with people with different expertise. In those spaces, we are also questioning what does widening participation mean? How can we make sure that people who are generally missing in these conversations have an opportunity? Some of you have actually been designing crowdsourcing projects. Some of you are designing citizen science projects. Some of you are working with indigenous communities. What does that mean to actually have them involved in a way that they have space to be heard and listened to, but also become part of the research that you do? A huge commitment to EDIA, equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Valuing people as well as their skills. It's not just about defining what a typical ideal researcher looks like, but leaning into the diversity of people, their experiences, backgrounds, and different skills they're able to bring. So not everybody uh, generates the same idea or expresses the homogeneous view, but actually can advocate for different kinds of background, including their own cultural and personal experiences. And we're all trying to better the research culture through open science so that we build pathway to leadership, not just for few people, but for as diverse people as possible. In open leadership, we also think about what could it mean in practice? So it is definitely about team-oriented leadership model. Rather than one leader, you think about multiple leaders who are working towards building building healthy, open culture of engagement by embodying inclusivity, transparency, flexibility, or adaptability, collaboration, and community. Uh, of course, the more you move towards leadership, it's less about the specific technology you build. It's more about the culture that you foster where people can actually build those technology that benefits them. And on the right, this is something that I care about a lot, is that when we share our work giving fair, fair attribution to the people who have contributed to the development of the work. We know that nobody works alone these days. So also thinking about how we are acknowledging people. What is open leadership not? So in open source, you can think about people are volunteers and they're contributing to developing things and it's great and we can bring people together and get them to work together. Um, but also thinking about their well-being and their compensation. So it's not a free labor, thinking about how we're comp compensating them in terms of acknowledgement, rewards, incentive, opportunities, and when possible, also money. It is also not a way to avoid process or structure, just because there are people who might be working sometimes in unpaid capacity or informal capacity, it does not mean that you don't provide them process or structure. It is very important to be transparent from the very beginning. Also, it's not a way to hit your deadline faster. You might build a goal, an agenda, and a timeline, and you might get in many people involved, but you can't pressurize them to meet the deadline faster. Collaboration is hard. Collaboration requires time, and you need to allow that time. In the long term, that collaboration is what you care about than deadline itself. Open leadership requires that you're always clear about the goals that you're trying to achieve and how does it generate value for people who are trying to work with you. So thinking about value exchange. And we will come back to this topic again. Those who are asking for the enabling translation, I, I will not because there is an author AI. So Shayun, if you can, please uh, reshare the author AI, please do. So I'm going back to this. Clearly communicate goals. We also want to have always the transparent system. So open science, always thinking about how is it 
sharing what we are doing internally so other people can also understand it. So thinking about what are the process for content development? What are the process for decision making? How are we sharing information? Sometimes it's very easy for us to do the thing before we define how we do the thing. So as an open leader, you have to sometimes step back and think about how we will do certain things, communicate that with others, and then do the thing itself. Also, it requires that we go back and revise our work. It's never fixed. It is actually the beauty of open source and open leadership where everything is emergent and everything actually inform each other and improves each other. So if you don't take time to reflect on the learnings from your current process, you would never know how to improve your process itself. So this is what I showed you last time, that open leadership design, build and empower their project and communities for understanding, sharing and participation and inclusion. So we already saw these three things about what we do as practice. But we also want to emphasize on open by design, active co-building process and empowering each other in building that work. So I would not go through this framework because I would share this document with you and you can go through all of these uh, one by one, and which is what you are actually doing in your self-assessment as well. So if you have done self-assessment or if you would be doing self-assessment, you would see that these are the framework we touch on in the assessment process. We want you to reflect on how much have you thought about in the past, the design process itself. And when you do design, do you think about understanding? When you think about understanding, are you thinking about the content understanding, understanding of the interaction itself, understanding of the decision making, and same for sharing and participation. After design, you move on from, once we have designed, we have to build as well. And I would actually say co-build, collaborative build. You would think about, have I built a communication pathway? Have I thought about maintenance of my work? Have I thought about project management? Once I have done all of those, have I thought about sharing, for example, how to apply license, how to apply documentation? And we will be talking about in the next cohort calls as well. So yeah, I won't discuss everything here because you're already doing self-assessment and you would have an opportunity to go back to this framework. But throughout the cohort call, we will be moving across these six areas. I want to finish with this one, which is about transparency of governance from the start. Even if you are a person working on certain things alone, you are making decisions. And governance is about defining formal and informal practices through which you set a goal, assign responsibilities, establish system, or assess an outcome. It's about really making sure that the decisions that are being made are clear to others. So also thinking about who makes decision and how, who participates and how, who is responsible to address if there are risks and challenges, and how would they address this risk, and who controls and protects the outcome, which means that who decides that this outcome is important, and who was not involved in deciding those outcomes. In community building, which is my area of expertise, we always think about how can we move towards more decentralized decision-making, meaning that rather than one directional information or sometimes consulting people, how can we actively involve them? How can we collaborate with them? How can we empower them so they are able to do their work on their own? And you won't get there on the day one, but this is where you wanna head towards. So with that, um, I'm going to actually prepare you now for your interaction with each other. So we covered the open leadership and I'm going to put you in a breakout room for about 15 minutes so you can chat with each other, uh, get to know each other. So I will try my best to put people in their own mentoring group, um, but don't worry if you're not in the same mentoring group, I would make sure that in the next, next breakout room you are. Um, and these are the discussion prompts for you. Once you're in the room, please share with each other your name, your affiliation, your path to DRI, EDIA program, and how do you work openly? If you have more time, uh, and if you have done self-assessment, I would also invite you to share main insights. I'm gonna stop for a second and check if there are any questions in the room. Okay, if not, Please give me a moment before I can move you across in different rooms. Okay. 
in it. Those who have just joined, we have spent uh, the initial part of this call discussing open leadership and people were in a first breakout room discussing what, how they came to EDIA fellowship and what open leadership means to them. I'm sure you would have more opportunity to talk to each other. Um, and I would actually now move on to the next part, which is introduction for tooling for project design. So this is the main focus of our um, calls today. Let me see. I hope you can't see the Zoom extra. So the project, th this particular cohort call kind of focuses on how we can clearly communicate our project idea, purpose, and goals in a way that will invite and encourage participation from our community. And when I say community, you can think about community. It could be a team member that you're working with. It could be a group of people you're interested in collaborating together with. Or it could be a much broader community that you hope to mobilize with your work. The learning objective of today's session is at the end of the session, we will be able to identify what tools are needed to help design our project in a way that new people can quickly understand what project is about. And they can also identify who can be involved and where their work is headed towards. We will introduce you to Open Canvas for your project to think through an open project strategy and develop a minimum viable product. MVP comes from startups, of course, and the Canvas is actually adopted from Lean Canvas. We want you to focus on priority. You are with us for only three to four months. And of course, you may have really big ideas and in five to 10 years, you would be able to achieve them. So we're focusing on where do we start from today? And you would also create a roadmap for your project with, with some milestones, tasks, and descriptions. You might not be able to complete all of that in today's call, but today you would have an uh, opportunity to learn what tools can be used for doing this. We will have two short talks by Gracilia and I on open canvas and project road mapping. You can also find a previous calls recording on, on our video library. And since this call is being recorded, we will also be sharing that for later access. So before we head to that, I have a task for you. Um, one thing that we like to do is to make sure that you all have a way to track your own progress and see where you are at. At the same time, allow other people to see what your project is about. So we'll spend some time on this. I don't think we'll require as much time because a lot of you are very experienced in GitHub. So we will be creating an issue on GitHub. And um, I've described that in the document, but I'm just going to demo you what that means. So in this particular GitHub repository, we collect different uh, ideas that the people are bringing in OLS9. So as you all, you all have been told that we have another track working with us, it's called Catalyst Track, and they have created issues about their own project, which is what we are trying to do with you. So I'm gonna open Molar Health. In fact, Molar Health was part of our program last year as well. So Molar Health is run by Onabajo. Onabajo has three, uh, two teammates, her mentor is Jose Luis Milka, and she is um, able to, for example, click on these as she progresses and click that so she doesn't get confused, which is what you would be doing today. So please take a couple of minutes. It shouldn't take you too long to create a new issue. You would click on new issue, click on issue for project in OLS 9, and you would write your project name and you would also update your, your own name. So, add, so you would be adding your name and your mentor name is not right now there. So that's completely fine. So I'm gonna stop here and give you like a couple of minutes to do that. You can also find the instruction in this document. So you have step one, step two, step three. Should be very easy. If you have any question, you can ask us. I'm going to stop. <laughs> uh, so this is an example of a field in Open Canvas. Notice that it's super succinct. It's, it's just like taking note of a brainstorm session, kind of. And, and about the minim minimal viable product or outcome, as we might uh, want to call it, uh, so the Open Canvas helps to identify the needs and resources that are critical to create an MVP a minimum viable product. 
Uh, an MVP is a concept that comes from the startup world and always best to build an M MVP first to test out the project and ensure the idea works before expanding it. So think about it as kind of a prototype of what you want to build or the only the, the main thing that you can have at the end of this OLS program, for example, that you can uh, let people know that your project is rolling and ask them to test to see what works and then you can adapt it. So it's not kind of the final, final product is the prototype. Um, if your project is not fitting the, into the open canvas model, it might be too broad. Um, and maybe you're trying to fit fitting too much and you need to narrow your scope. So it's very common that we start filling in the problem session and then we find out that the problem that we have thought about is actually too broad, is too vague. And then the idea is that you come back, rethink on your problem and think if you can pick one or two points that are more specific, that is more reachable. Uh, now we are going to do an exercise to try and fill in the open canvas for your project using the shared template. Let me stop sharing the screen. Um, does everyone have the template? Um, you can show them in the document. Yeah. Here, found it. <laughs> I'm sending in the chat, but it's online. Oh, I can't see the lines in my etherpad. Line 198. Thank you, Malvika. Um, how, how much time do we have for that? We have allocated 20 minutes, um, but I also want to acknowledge we are an hour into the call. So if folks mm -hmm. need to take five minutes break, please do. Um, and we will round up that 20 minutes with the break that you need. Okay, so every single one of us will have a unique slide in the in the power in the uh, slides shared here. So you would create a copy for yourself. You don't uh -huh. have to use the same. So when you create a copy, that's your personal copy, and uh, you would keep that to yourself. But we will ask you to share that when you're ready on the issue that you've just created on OLS nine. Okay, thank you. And there's also a space in the Etherpad right below the line that I sent in the chat for you to write any insights, thoughts, comments, questions that you might have while you are filling in your canvas. So I've put the timer for 20 minutes. As I said, please take five minutes break, come back or do it and take the break. Uh, we'll just round that up together. I'm going to pause the recording. Can have everyone Thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't think we can have everyone talking, but let's uh, share your thoughts and self-reflections. How was building your open canvas? What, what was hard? Let me know one thing that was really hard, one thing that was really great to do it. <laughs> Who wants to start? Don't be shy. <laughs> oh, hands up. Uh, Azam, do you want to start? What I like, can you hear me? Yeah, it's really quiet, okay. but we can. Oh, it's you, okay, sorry for that. Uh, what I really like about that is that it gives me a clear picture of my project. Because even when I was writing the proposal, I had the same problem. Now I feel that with this schedule, with this uh, plan, with this diagram, it, it works much more better. And uh, but I had some difficulties understanding the voice, such as the 
user channels? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, identifying things that you didn't know exactly how to do, uh, it's a good thing. So you can think about that more focusedly as you go through the first few weeks. You can um, discuss that with your mentor. So if you have a user group that is already specified, you can think of how you can reach out to them during the week. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Make note of that and discuss that with your mentor. All right, Laura. Um, so, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so for me, it was, I was a little bit overwhelmed with like all the things that I have to do for this project and all that. So at the beginning, I was like overwhelmed when I was writing the problem. So like, I wanted to make like, the problem clear, like small and clear in a phrase. And it took me a little bit. But I did it. Then the solution also was a little complicated. But then as I started like doing all the other steps, it became clearer and clearer. So I really like that. I'm feeling less overwhelmed about my project. And like I can I I even like um got ideas about like other channels that I can use and like things that I was missing in my proposal that I would have like it was a really good thought process. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, I super identify with that because every time that I get along with like ecologists, they are always thinking about all the things that can go wrong and all that. <laughs> and I'm always thinking about the open campus and try to be, okay, let's think of one thing that we can do. <laughs> so I super identify with being overwhelmed with the big problem and then taking the open canvas and being more, okay, I can achieve that. <laughs> Thank you. Good to Yes. Um, I think that for me is at the beginning, I think that I decided to write in English and then I realized that it was not that easy because how I think my project since the beginning, I always think in French. And when I try to write in English, it's not like I didn't have the kind of word I really want to use. When I decided to write in French, it was quite easy for me because I already think about working on this project or that orientation during the step that I was writing my project. I think this was quite easy for me when I decided to write in my first language I can say that, yeah. That's a great point as well. I'm not an English speaker like native. Um, for me, sometimes it's easier as well to write in my native language just because we have, maybe sometimes we have shorter words for that or we have a, a way to say that is more straight to the point. Um, so just a reminder, this is an exercise for you. So feel free to write in your in the language that you're more comfortable writing. So it's a document for your own guidance. Write the way that is easier for you, that is more clear for you. No need to write in English. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up, Kosir. Mohammed. Yes, thank you. So I have two points to raise actually um, here. One about the key metrics in the open canvas and the other one about the idea itself. So um, for the past uh, few days, I was actually uh, thinking of starting deploying my project and it was supposed to be, um, it's automated fake news detection systems using um, deep learning models. But the problem I am facing right now is um, the um the group that I want to start with um the equity seeking group so um the, actually it's not a good idea to start building an algorithm or a model with members who don't really know anything about the concept itself the fake news concept um so I'm I'm not sure whether I can actually um, adjust my um, proposed idea or not because I already um, this is what I get uh, this um, funding actually for is to train and build models for fake news detection. So I'm not sure if I can um, modify or adjust my idea now to just train the uh, equity seeking groups on. Um, detecting fake news or fake news uh, detection in general, uh, building a general uh, prototype maybe for detection instead of just going uh, deeper with uh, special kind of algorithms. 
this is my first concern. And the second point is the key metrics. Uh, if I want to go with the second um uh, with the second part of my uh, thinking, which is um, training the equity, the equity seeking groups on detect cheating or detect fake news on social media. So, what are the matrices that I will be using in my um, in my um, open canvas? Let's say in, in my uh, reporting. So, is it just gonna be the feedback that I receive from these uh, groups or? Because like with with models or with programming, I, I would say okay, the accuracy of these models must be greater than eighty percent. Let's say so. This is one of the metrics I will be using. But in case of uh, training or giving sessions and um, um, without developing any kind of models, without any quantitative um, kind of matrices, what should I uh, mention in my project? Yeah, sorry, sorry about these uh, okay. long points. <laughs> No, it's great. Um, I'm going to also invite Malvika to answer that. But before, uh, I have a consideration about the canvas and the changing project kind of thinking. Um, that's also from my experience. But you can have open canvas, different open canvas for different stages of your project. So sometimes you don't need to change the whole thing. But maybe your project that you proposed is a big project that contains several smaller projects within it. And you can think of that in that way, like break down a big problem into smaller problems. And then you can have an open project, open canvas for each of these. Um, in terms of metrics, that's something that is really worth discussing with your mentor, uh, the technical mentor, your open science mentor. But I really like your saying that the, it's one thing to have a key metric for your algorithm and another metric for the training because they are completely different things. I've done my first open project was a training and things that you can think about is number of people being trained, um, retaining of people after training. Um, if you're training for a specific kind of attitude or movement or community movement kind of thing, you can think of ways to assess that after the training is over. So there are a lot of things that you can think about in terms of training. It, it's super worth discussing that with your mentor. And I know there are other champions here also working with trainings. So maybe you can discuss together as well. Malvika? I just wanted to say that it's not very untypical that people in OLS come in and they realize that there was a previous step that they missed and they changed their project. We have had one of the worst case scenario where a person took four months to iterate and find the right project they wanted to pursue. And that's absolutely fine. And I want to just say that if you've identified that you missed that step of first engaging the community who you actually want to you know, further involve in the production of technology itself, that's a worth time investment on. So you are very welcome to change your project. Um, you're here and that, that's it. We don't really, mind as much as what project you initially proposed but beside that everything Rasili said is absolutely correct jane this would be the last question and they'll move on jane go ahead thank you thank you so much so um my my mind is more of an observation i'm not sure and I'm, i've been struggling and i hope to get more comfortable how it aligns very well with people in the social sciences, especially maybe someone from a legal background like I, I am from. Um, because when you're talking about um, community engagement in the development, like it's, I know that it's okay to engage the community and, you know, let them be part of the process, but I'm not sure how it's, I'm finding it very, even when I was taking the self-assessment, um, I was finding it difficult. So uh, will I get more comfortable? Will it be more adaptable? And all of that. Thank you for bringing that. Um, so we've had some project, which were legal projects that have gone through OLS. And I have to say, it's not very typical that lawyers or legal work are done openly, right? And which is why you're also finding that difficult. It's not traditionally trained um, for people to go out and create these things openly. Um, so I can completely see the challenge that's upcoming. But what I would encourage is that through this program, you're challenging the norm 
of how things have always been done. So if your field is not typically comfortable working with broader community, think about can you work with other lawyers or other legal people or people who are from your own field. So rather than going to act like, you know, when you say social context, you could also think about professional context as your professional community. A lot of time when I work, I don't really work with the public. I work with the professional network of open science practitioners and they can be my network. So community can be very loosely defined. So maybe that's the thing to step back and say, who are my community? Am I considering community as people who I work with, my team members, for example? Because you can, you have to be open with your team members. And if you haven't figured that out, like who you're working with, that is very important as Graciely was saying. If you don't have other people you're working with, you'll find this challenge quite difficult because what we are asking you is to really think about how do you collaborate with others in co-creating solution. So uh, that would be my suggestion, Jane, but of course, very happy to like talk through one-on-one -on -one and see if there are some conversation that could be useful for you. On that note, I would say that we're gonna move on, but I want to say one more thing from our experience working with eight groups of very international community. When we teach you something, we're not saying that that's the absolute truth. It's a version of truth, a version of practice that we know and has worked for us. It's possible that some of those practices do not fit your project. And it's absolutely fine to say, well, this does not fit my project and I'm gonna find an alternative and work with that. It could also be that sometimes we introduce a concept. A lot of these concepts have been developed in Western context. So we can completely see that they are not serving all the world. So if there are things that you figure that this does not work for me, it does not work for my community, we are very welcome. We welcome you to actually challenge that. We also want you to challenge the whole thing we are teaching or doing together. Um, so this is a place for you to think critically rather than assuming that all that we teach applies to your work as we show it. Um, Thank you for taking the time. And we're actually moving on to the next part. And this next part could be very much related to what uh, we've been talking about, which is, let me go back, which is about creating your vision. Thank you for whoever is taking note because they are always helpful to come back to. All these great conversation, we kind of forget. So uh, please do take notes here. I see that's Graciela who's taking notes. So we're gonna move on to um, the vision, the project vision. Some of you have already started working on it. And uh, if you haven't, please create a copy that you can find in the line 219. If you've already created a copy, do not create another copy. You can just go back to your original document. I'm gonna show you what this document actually has. So you all know what vision means. It's the big idea that you can communicate with others. In the place where we work with community, the idea of communicate, communicating vision is to ensure that people who are aligned with your vision can join you, even if you didn't think that they might be interested in it. But articulating a vision requires that we know what we wanna achieve in the long term. So before you start drafting your one single line, very concise vision, you might wanna take some time to think about what do you plan to create as a leader in the next 10 months? You could also think about it 12 months a year. The vision of what will be so if I'm successful in my work. So the project that you're developing, what is your vision for that to be successful? You can also go even further than just 10 months. You can think about what, what will be in five years or 10 years or 20 years time. What is the overall big vision? Why is this vision important to you and what's in it for you and what's in it for others? It's just going back to the conversation we were just having, it's not about you. Open science is never about just one person. It has to be about people and other people, other community, other context, improving a situation. So what does that mean for others? Think about two or three key activities or critical point that we should know about your vision. What is the difference your, what is the difference your vision will make for you, for the community, and if you're thinking even bigger, for the world. So please spend some time, about 10 minutes, thinking about that. And once you're ready, you would start drafting a one single line of your vision. And we've created like a formula through open leadership. And that formula is starting with what you're doing, why you're doing this, and who the users and contributors are. 
um, I would say, please spend most of your time thinking the bigger vision and then come back to this. And if you're not able to do this during the call, you can always go back to it. And at one point when you're ready, you would also go and try to make it jargon free. It should not be a very complicated jargony thing. It should be very, very simple. It could be things like, I wanna make life of X community better, or I wanna make accessing X resources easy. So think about keeping it very simple. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, give you 10 minutes to think about your big idea and then prompt you to start drafting your vision. And again, the document link is in the line number 220 now. I would also copy that in the chat. Let me know if you have any questions. Are there, are there any insights you would like to share from your vision statement? Is there any question you have that we can address before we move on to the next one? Okay, if not, then we are actually moving into kind of a segue, where, which goes very nicely from vision, and I'll pass it to Graciele. Hi, back to me. <laughs> um, so in the uh, frame pad on line 258, let me copy the link to that in the chat. Oh, there are comments. I need some extra time to think about my vision. If I have questions later, where can I get help with that? Go back to Slack, share us in, in the Slack and uh, we will make sure that we do engage with that. But you can also share your vision statement on your issue as a comment and we'll make sure that we visit that and leave some comment. And also I encourage you all to look at each other's issue and give feedback. Um, I am very close to also identifying if we can hold weekly coffee chat with you all. So especially if you miss a part of the call and want to come back and chat, um, I would most likely hold that on Friday and Thursdays alternatively. So if you want to have verbal chat, that would be your place. Awesome. And yeah, it's really tough to condense your whole vision to one statement that's the challenge and that's the exercise to uh, make us have a more clear vision for our project okay let's move on to setting goals um, as we said before in the open canvas it's important for us to have very clear specific and time-bound goals and an exercise to do that in the line 258 you have a link to a document we ask you to make a copy. Let me share the screen quickly. So this is the document that you're going to see. The exercise is for you to think on goals in this pop format. So you're going to think your, about your, the purpose of your project. What, why are you doing this? Uh, what, what motivates you to start doing this project? What, what made you sign up for the Alliance Champions program? Um, the outcomes, what are the outcomes that you expect to have at the end of this program, at the end of these four months? And what is the process? How do you think you can get from where you are right now until uh, where you want to be? So what are the steps that you need to take? What is the process? What like think of that as a big thing that you need to break into smaller steps. Um, that's the exercise. <laughs> uh, anything to add, Movika? Um, so you so I don't. I just wanted to say that we are um, we're in an hour, and Gracie reminded me that we should take ten minutes break. So we'll take 10 minutes break, come back, and then you would spend another 10 minutes in uh, creating some of your, getting started. Anything that you're doing today is getting started. So don't think that you got to finish it on the call. Yeah, just, just something that I forgot to mention. In this document, you have these goals for the project and for yourself. Think of the goals for yourself as an open leader, uh, the goals for yourself within the scope of this project. Um, and the goals for your project in terms of these four months and the, the champions program. And also you can think of one goal that you want to achieve in the long, long term. 
uh, but don't feel pressured to achieve this goal within these four months. Okay, let's take a break. Awesome. <laughs> I hope you're all excited after thinking about your goals, your vision and all that. Uh, please share your thoughts, insights, comments on our frame pad. Um, do you have any pressing questions right now? Concerns? Jokes? No? Oh. Hi, Laura. Hello. Um, I, I'm struggling a little bit with this goal setting because I was like, I don't understand if this is for my project or for, like, is this related to the vision of the project or related to the objectives of the project itself? And like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little bit lost. Uh, yeah, so the goals are related to the project you're going to develop during these four months. Um, so you started designing your open canvas and then you have your problems and your solutions and then you develop your vision. Um, that would lead to you thinking on the goals to achieve the outcomes that you thought of for your project. And then you would need to break this down into smaller steps. Does okay. That... Yeah. So if I understand this goal setting would be like these smaller steps. Yeah. Okay. So you okay. have a big, a big goal. And then how do you break down the goal into smaller steps? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Uh, Liv? Hi, um, thank you for going so step by step. That's very helpful. There's so much information. It's very overwhelming. So I appreciate you moving slowly and helping us. Um, <laughs> I just have a question about the personal goals that we have and how they'll be like supported by the, mm -hmm. the DRAC, D, whatever, the Digital Research Alliance and like OLS and who we would direct our questions about those goals too. Like for example, like two out of three of my personal goals have to do with expanding my knowledge and my understanding and my expertise in things that I don't know what to do other than Google. So like, mm -hmm. will there be an opportunity for us to put these goals that you guys can help us with somewhere and then maybe have things directed to that or like, you know, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so those are great things to have on your notes, on your men mentor-mentee meetings. Those are the things that your mentor can help you with. And also some of the things we will cover during the OLS program. So it's, it's a good thing for you to have handy and keep in mind as we go through the program because you can achieve these goals and not even notice. <laughs> um, Malvika, do you want to add something? Yeah, so we're asking you for exactly that reason. The personal goal would be for you because a lot of time we would remind you over and over that your project requires you to be happy and successful and take care of yourself, which is why we ask you to create personal goal. Your personal goal can be that I want to have better work-life balance or boundary or whatever. That's personally me saying what I want to do better. Um, but the project goal is definitely aligned to what you have proposed as part of your project, but at the same time, um, making sure that you're actioning for what you want to do in the next three to four months rather than very big. You can always have big, but as Grassili is saying that this will allow you to create better milestone and know exactly how to assess. So these are not to sit in your document, this is to identify and plan. And there's a next step that's coming up very soon, which would make it more clearer how we are going to support you with actioning these goals. Great. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> sure. Okay. Let's move on to road mapping. Uh, so that's why we asked you to break your goals into smaller steps. That's because you're going to use that to create your roadmap. Uh, okay, so uh, as a reminder, open leaders design, build and empower the projects and communities for understanding, sharing and participation and inclusion. Um, so why do we need a roadmap? 
So for a new project, it's important to outline and plan for the work ahead and to share the plan with potential contributors. Uh, so the world map will also will help you to know what's the next step, but also will help you invite contributors and people to know where they can uh, start, where they can go with you and how they can help your project. A roadmap is a text document that summarizes the project vision, includes a timeline for tasks and help to identify where you are now, how to reach your projects and goals, the course that you need to take to get there, the dependencies among tasks and to schedule your, go your work and track goals and share that with anyone who might contribute to your project. So every step that you took so far with your canvas, your, your goals, will help you design your roadmap because now you have the steps that you need to reach your outcome and also the process, right? The pop principles, the purpose, the outcomes and the process. You're going to use that to create a roadmap. Uh, where goes a roadmap? A roadmap can go in, in your project summary and welcome. Um, it, it will serve to welcome and orient visitors to your project. So if you have a web page, for example, you're going to have a session that will present your project and you can add your roadmap there so people know where your project is at. If it's a planning or prototype, if people can test it already and things like that. Uh, it's important to help them understand where they are uh, after they have been linked directly to the roadmap. Sometimes contributors receive a link to the roadmap. Um, having the project summary first can help give give a clear focus when writing the rest of the roadmap what goes in a roadmap uh also after the summary and welcome you have uh, how to get involved uh new contributors might want to jump right away so you want to have in the roadmap points to parts of the project they can immediately work on and point to documentation they should check out. So if someone just found out about your project, they land in your roadmap, they read the summary, they're interested in the project, uh, they might want to contribute right away. What's the first thing that they need to know and what are the main uh, tasks that they can help with? The other things that contains in the roadmap is a timeline. The timeline is the star of your roadmap, so it helps you organize tasks to complete your project around my milestones and map what you're working on now and where it is going next. The milestones can uh, significant. Sorry. <laughs> the, the milestones are significant turning points or events that will move the project forward. Uh, so, for example, status goals, dates and events and timeframes. So now that you have the goals, the big goal and the smallest stepping stones to move you from where you are to your outcomes, you can spread them out into a timeline and define one, two, one to three milestones for your timeline. So the, those will be uh, very special dates and points in time where you need to check in your progress. Uh, timeline tasks, list tasks to complete for each milestone and include information with each task to make it easy for contributors. So things like what needs to be done, what the task looks like, pointers to get started and why this task, task is important and connect your task to your vision, to your project as well. Uh, so those are the informations that me as a contributor would need to know as I arrive to your project page uh, to understand where you're at and how I can contribute. And how to store your roadmap now that you have your document that delineates your goals and the timeline uh, where you can store it. So let me click on some examples. So. You can have a separate file. If you have a GitHub uh, repository, you can have a markdown document with all that written down uh, in a file called roadmap.md, for example. Let's see this example. So this is an example. You can see here roadmap.md is a markdown file. Uh, so it has delineated 
everything that you need to know about the project. So it has a motivation, uh, an introduction to the project, uh, the goals, the outcomes that they need to achieve. So it's a very extensive document and with a lot of links and resources. This is a very good example of a roadmap because it's very clear and people can understand everything that is there to know. Uh, let's check another. Okay, uh, another way that you can start your your roadmap is into a readme file. So a readme file is kind of a landing document with all the information that you need to know about your project. You can have within the readme a link to a roadmap or you can describe briefly your roadmap within the readme file. Uh, or you can have an issue in your GitHub repository. So let's click see this one. This is an issue you see here when you have these hashtags in the the GitHub, it means that it's an issue. Um, so you can have, so for example, here they have how to get involved, details about that, details about the timeline. So you see they uh, go checking the check boxes to mark when things are being, are being done and people can comment and refer back to this issue. So this is another way that you can create a roadmap. Um, you can use the projects on the GitHub we're going to go through that tomorrow, I guess, how to manage projects in GitHub. So here we have some examples. Let's go through that quickly. Oh, this doesn't exist anymore. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see this one. Maybe you'll oh. have to refresh that slide. I changed it. Oh, OK. Thank you. Because those were broken link. No, maybe they're private. Let me see if I can get on my. I will give you a link to a working project board <laughs> so this, um, this could help maybe sorry problem there's one this could work perfect thank you <laughs> so yeah we're going to the details of that tomorrow but uh github has a interface where you can add issues and manage issues in a Kanban style, so that uh, famous to do, doing, done framework or something like that. So you create categories and little cards. You can move the, it's because I'm not the owner of this uh, repository, but you can move these around um, and then the issues will be closed or reopened and things like that. So that's a good way to manage your roadmap. I think that's pretty much it um, so how to create a roadmap first you write a project mission and summary you kind of did that already so you need to have your project name and a shorter vision of your project description from the readme or you can use your vision statement so good thing that you did this exercise already then you need to pick one to three milestones think of your goals your smaller stepping stone goals and think on them in terms of timeline and then you need to list tasks to complete each milestone. So you're going to break your goals into even smaller steps and add a short description for each task required to successfully complete project work on a milestone and be sure to explain why you are doing this task. So it's important for you, even for your future self, to document the reasons why you are making the choices that you're making um, and this is a good place to put it on. Uh, and then let people know how they can get involved. So in the roadmap, you can have for each step how people can actually contribute. So for example, you have one of the goals to opening a diner that sells hot dogs. Uh, you're gonna need to buy the chairs for the diner and someone can come in and help you buy the chairs. Uh, and you are going to have a description of, OK, I'm going to need 65 chairs by this date and they need to be white. Um, and then people can, OK, I can buy 65 chairs for you and they will know exactly what to do to contribute to your project. Then you need to post a roadmap so people have access to it and then update often. So every time your goals are redefined or the tasks are completed, you need to update your roadmap. 
Now it's your time to create a roadmap for your project. Let me stop sharing. Uh, what questions do you have at this point? Yes, Ijoma. Thank you. And I have a couple of questions. So let me take us a bit back because as we move forward into the roadmap, I'm actually reflecting on my vision statement and I'm wondering whether my vision statement was too far-fetched. So in the document, I saw, like think about what you want to achieve in the next 10 months. And then the next thing I see is five, 10, 20 years down the line. So I was confused as to whether my vision statement should be for this short term of 10 months or should it actually be for that longer term? And so I created one that is like broader. But now as I'm looking at the roadmap, I think like that vision statement is too far away and I might need to step back. So my question is how far should this vision statement be? Is it for this specific project or is it where we want to be? Then my second question is when you talked about the different ways that we can post the, the roadmap, right? So there's the option of like putting that issue and then there's the one of GitHub and there's the one of like the different ones. I think there was, I need to go through the slides again, but then I'm wondering which one we should actually do for this project and what you recommend in terms of maybe best practice or what is most helpful or efficient. And then the last question I had was- uh, Maybe address two questions and then come to last question because I do, I'm, I'm sure I'll forget the third question. Okay. So the first one, vision is always big. Vision is always sta sta stable, I would say. Um, and over the years, your vision itself does not change. I'm not saying that it would never change, but mostly it shouldn't change. So for example, the vision that we set for OLS is to diversify leadership in open science. It wouldn't change. What we do to get there can continue to change, which is where your mission or roadmap comes in. Um, there's another project that I lead, which is called the Turing Way. And our vision statement is making reproducibility too easy not to do. It is a moonshot goal because the vision itself is you know, unachievable in this case, because you could never achieve reproducibility for everyone. So think about vision as your guiding star. This is the direction that you're going to. It may take forever to get there and maybe you would never get there, um, but that's the, that's the aim, right? So keep the vision as big as possible, which is why we're asking you, what is your big idea? What you're doing today, which is gonna change your community, your world in the five, 10 years, 15 years time. And your project could be a part of executing your vision. Um, so it will take some iteration. So don't think that you have to do it in five minutes and move on and you can never come back and change it. You can really think about what your vision is. And this is the place to actually establish yourself. What is your leadership in this area? Who, if you weren't here, what wouldn't happen? So maybe it's a little bit too idealistic, but think in that direction. So that's the vision. Think about vision as always big. The roadmap, what you're creating, allows you to actually start creating steps towards that direction, right? So because you're, you're gonna work with us only three to four months, your roadmap should be, what do I need to do in the next, two, next three to four months? And you would, you're you always working towards your vision, but you also need to be actionable. So what can you actually achieve in three to four months, which is in the direction of vision? So I would suggest take some time, do some iteration, the roadmap can also update over the period, but just think about what do I need to do in the next one month, what I'm able to do as well, right? What's your third question? Yeah, the, the follow up. So it's second part of that second question is there are different ways that have been shared. So for example, the readme file, I don't know. I don't, oh, I yeah. don't know how to That's do true. that. So I think it's easy. It's I think it's easier to say, okay, we can go to uh, use the template that you've shared. But so then I would say to that, pause on it for a moment because on 17th, we are going to help you start setting up your project. And then you would be able to select either GitHub or Google Doc or whatever else works for you. 
So we're going to give you all options. The important thing is what works for you and what works for your community. Our default would be GitHub. But if you feel that you're not ready for GitHub, I would still recommend please attend the skill up session or watch the recording because GitHub will allow you to maintain versions of your document and do it openly. But if you just decide, no, GitHub is not for me, absolutely fine. It's your project. You have to decide what is the best way to manage and maintain your documentation in a way that allows other people to look at it. Um, but don't worry about it today. We have given you enough work to do. Don't worry about finishing them all. The project setting, we're going to come back to on 17th. Okay, sorry. I have a follow-up question on the vision statement. So for example, my vision statement for my research, it's slightly different from my vision statement that I could say for my DRI project. So which why one? is that? That's a good question. Why, why would you not have your project, your current work contributing to your bigger vision? So the thing is, the my research interests is like more research, like focused for certain health problems. For the DRI pro, uh, projects, the DRI for the DRI projects, it's also my interest, but it's not exactly. I don't know how to put. I don't know the best thing because when you have a call, you have to align your project to the call, right? So the the DRI has um the the goals of the the champions program which is part of what my interest is but that's not my research area okay yes. um i think that's a question for you to bring to your mentor and one thing that mentor that your mentor could help you do is align your goals with what you're doing um or vice versa whatever is your priority so do keep that question, um, but at the moment when you're creating your roadmap, focus on what you're planning to do with the project. Um, yes, that is clear. So that's why the vision statement was confusing. Is it for this project or is it the, the overall broad goal of? That's a good, good question, yeah. Ideally, your every work should should contribute to the vision, but I completely see where you're coming from. And I hope you're, you can have that chat with your mentor. I'm gonna take a last question from Liv because I would really love for you all to do a last breakout discussion with each other. Liv? Oh, that's all good. I uh, had a question about selecting a platform too, which can wait, so thanks. Yeah, yeah, we have given you enough work already. So I have already created a breakout uh, a lot of breakout rooms. And if someone drops or joined, um, I can also send you to different breakout room. We are now in the line 286, where we are asking you to actually just chat with each other, you know, forget about the prompt. I'll send the prompt in the chat, but I know that there has been a lot that we have given you to think about. So just go and decompress and talk to each other. How did you feel today has gone for you? Are there reflection for you to take back or you know, just complain. It was too much. I didn't know what was coming. So do whatever you need to do. Connect with each other. I've tried to put you in a room with your uh, mem members, team members, but if they have dropped off, I have moved you to a room where the other members are. So I'm going to open the room, bring you back in 10 minutes and leave last 20, 10, two minutes to set you up for next time. Don't have to finish. Thank you so much. Um, so whatever we have introduced today, please continue working on that. Whatever you have started, you can build on it. You can ask us question on Slack. You can ask us question by email if you feel more comfortable. Um, and uh, we have added an optional exercise for those who were super speed with what they were doing. Those who haven't had the chance to finish everything, please continue working on that. Next week, we will have call on very similar call on um, project design for collaboration. And that's where you will be setting up a repository or a documentation for your own project. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, thank you for being with us for three hours, two minutes. It has been really fantastic to see a lot of you and talk to a lot of you. And we see you next time. And thank you so much, Graceli and Sheoen for all this facilitation you all have done. And we'll see you next time. Yeah.
Thank it's you. It's the same time on Thank 17. You. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.